intro, thank you. I thought this was an April Fool's prank, but here I am. It was 6 p.m. on a Saturday evening, not a day or time of remote significance to most of us. But for me, this Saturday evening, my life was completely transformed. The limits of my reality challenged, and my life changed forever. It was the first time I tried chocolate. I was eight years old, sitting in the living room with my dad, when one of our neighbors stopped by to drop off a souvenir from her son's recent travels in America. It was nothing like I'd ever seen before. As I reached out to open the golden, shiny wrappings, my fingers brushed against the soft, shiny surface, revealing hundreds of dark, thinly sliced layers, melting into one another an amalgamation of perfectly symmetrical sheets of cocoa. Not too bitter, not too sweet. Just what chocolate should be. As I ate that chocolate, I marveled at the stories my dad told me about our neighbor's son and his travels in America. At eight years old, listening to him detail these stories with such intense admiration and passion led me to one simple conclusion. I had to go. I decided that day that my future was in America. I had to go to the land of my dreams in the land of that shiny chocolate. Growing up in a middle-class Indian household, great emphasis is placed on academic performance, ensuring that we receive higher education, which will eventually lead to a financially secure vocation. To majority of us in India, the epitome of glory was coming to America. We grew up watching Disney Channel shows, Hollywood movies that portrayed the greatness, the freedom, the dreams and desires our parents had for us. Outcomes we couldn't fathom outside of America. People I knew would come to America and return back with completely different mannerisms, wearing shorts, sunglasses, and ear earphones. Even before AirPods were popular, we call them U.S. returns. I've come to realize there's a stigma attached to immigrant families. People think that we come here to steal jobs from American citizens, to capitalize on our diversity, as if we're less worthy than our counterparts. In reality, we come here because we want to build a better life than our parents. Just like any other kid, we want to make our parents proud. We're given three options, doctors, engineers, and lawyers. Master's degrees and added plus if you want to outshine others. There are these people, you might know them as Google CEO Sundar Pichai, Top Chef host and actor Padma Lakshmi, and CEO of Starbucks, Lakshman and Narasimhan. These are individuals of South Indian origin who accomplish feat greater than any immigrant can imagine. So I knew I had to go to America not to become a U.S. return, I had my AirPods, but to satisfy my sweet tooth and find that mysterious chocolate. But this sense of childhood dynamic, this sense of competition, just like in chocolate, smaller doses might be good, but too much of it can quickly become sickening and bitter. I don't share this to elicit pity. I share this because I want to provide insight into where this drive in immigrant families come from. In some ways, America was everything that I was looking for. In other ways, I was entirely unprepared. I felt like I was in a movie, constantly exposed to a revolving door of experiences, which to people around me were part of their everyday activity. But for me, it was extraordinary. The roads, the traffic system, people, the mannerisms. Everyone's first time in America is unique, unforgettable, exciting, thrilling, overwhelming. It's a snowball of emotions that hits you like a truck. If you don't have your own story, ask your friend, your neighbor, or your grandma. Arriving in America, as my feet touched the ground as I stepped out of the plane in the bright, shiny city of Atlanta, Georgia, and then Gainesville, Florida, was an instant deja vu moment for me, taking me right back to my eight-year-old self, eating that chocolate in that living room with my dad. 
my first time eating that chocolate was quite akin to my first time in America. But I miss my family, my friends, my room, my routine. To be honest, it took me more than a few months to get used to and acclimated to America. The one thing that I did not miss was the constant bombardment of facial cream advertisements asking me to improve my skin color. So the majority of facial cream advertisements in India are targeted towards darker skinned women to improve their skin color. A lot of girls wanted to be fair. So did I. No one ever complimented a girl with my skin color. Movies never portrayed somebody who looked like me. And marriage advertisements were always asking for women who were skinny and fair. In fact, I remember having this conversation with my cousin about 15 years ago. Keep in mind, he's not the sexiest man alive. He claimed his perfect bride-to-be, a fair, skinny maiden. And I was like, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? But in America, my skin color was valued and adored and was not seen as an ailment to be cured. People were fascinated by my skin color, not in a bad way. I was completely taken aback. I was not used to receiving compliments for my skin color. So in my head, this was a win. I was winning. Hashtag vanity. It was little moments like these, moments of, oh, everything is so different here, but not in a bad way. Things that I initially considered as overwhelming or alarming were actually like a breath of fresh air. Just like that chocolate, it took me a little bit of time to adjust, whether it be by my coursework in structural engineering, talking to my professors, or making friends along the way. Once I established a sense of continuity, I was able to appreciate the opportunities America presented me with and the experiences that I was dreaming for so long instead of reveling in nostalgia. I found myself to be fully present and I was willing to appreciate the variety of everything. I was finally getting used to my newfound chocolate land in the explosion of freedom and opportunities it presented me with. But the dating scene here, y'all, it is so different. Dating back in India was pretty easy. Boy meets girl, boy teases girl, bam, they're in a relationship. If you like each other, you hold hands, you're a couple, boyfriend, girlfriend. And if you kiss, you're kind of making a permanent vow. Imagine marrying your first kiss. Go ahead, I'll wait. Enough said, that was about 10 years ago. Regardless, dating in America is so different. It is so variable. It's like a heart-shaped box of chocolate. You never know what flavor you're gonna get. You can kiss, not be in a relationship. After all, there's a process of asking somebody to be your boyfriend or girlfriend. You have to hang out with them, get a feel for, can you see a future with them? And then there's meeting friends, family, going on trips, moving in together, engagement. You spend a lot of time with your significant other before the prospect of marriage. An added plus if your significant other has an accent. Recent international polls reveal British, Australian, French accents to be the sexiest ones out there. No one has ever looked at an Indian man or Indian woman and said, hey, that accent is hot. I know. It's more along the lines of, you speak great English. Not like, let me take you on a date, baby girl. <laughs> Besides this, you do have to consider your life outside of your relationship, which for me was academics. To be honest, y'all, I have a confession. To my previous boyfriends, I was not 100% into you. More like 50% or maybe 45. The other half of my heart was betrothed to my one true love, the apple of my eyes, and simultaneously, the source of my misery, my thesis. As graduate students, yes, my thesis, I know. As graduate students, we tend to stick together. 
united by our mutual suffering of spending five plus years together creating our thesis. And also the fact, to put it simply, we're broke. I know. Despite of our similarities, I was painfully aware of the fact that I spoke differently than them. I fancied the ease in which they could have conversations in their American accent, and I was here struggling with my B's and W's. Let's try pronouncing. Volume. Vampire? My fears as an immigrant were not like the fears of my peers. My struggle with pronunciation was a constant trigger of fear of mockery by those around me, a fear a lot of immigrants face, even whilst doing simplest things like ordering food. I would order food and people would yell at me saying, what, what? I was terrified because I didn't know if I said something wrong or I did something wrong. But when I was teaching, I felt like the most authentic version of myself. I was able to use my experience as a graduate student and empathize with the students that I was working with. I remember my first in-person conference as a faculty. The presentation itself was a blur, but what stood out to me was the amount of self-doubt I had in myself. The presentation couldn't have gone any better, but it made me question, what is the reasoning behind my self-doubt? Was it my upbringing? Or was it the constant cycle of toxic competition perpetuated by immigrant cultures? So I wanted to approach this as an engineer, a problem solver, and a chocolate lover. Here's what I found. Our insecurities are some of past experiences, people's perspective, and our inner critic. We all have them, right? Might as well use them to our advantage. To those of us who've had the misfortune of being exposed to the glory that is physics, this is free body diagram and the forces acting on it. Newton's first law of motion states that a body will continue to be in a state of rest or will keep moving in a straight line until it's compelled to change its course by an external force acting on it. I'm sure we all have moments in our life or we're not happy with the current trajectory of our life. Yet instead of questioning how we can reorient ourselves in a way that serves us, sometimes we revel in complacency, obeying the laws of physics laid out by Newton, waiting for some magical sort of achievement or accomplishment to propel us forward and reassure us that we're on the right track. Well, I'm not here to question everything that we know about physics and unravel the quantum timeline. That would lead to some disastrous implication. I don't think we're ready for that. I'm not ready for that. But I do have a question for all of us. When was the last time you felt truly alive or joyful in your heart? Think about this one. I can almost guarantee you it was now when you got that A grade, that promotion, or that monetary increase. And if it was, hopefully I can change your mind. For me, it was this moment, my graduation. Not because I graduated, honestly, I walked even before I knew I was graduating. It was because I got to see my parents after three years. I got to hold my mom after three years. She didn't care if I graduated or not. That moment did not need an external force or validation. That moment made me question my internal confidence model. We're all under this pretense that confidence comes after some sort of external achievement as if we don't deserve to feel proud of ourselves or revel in joy until we've accomplished something that is deemed worthy. But in reality, confidence needs to be moved in here before any sort of external achievement or accomplishment. I came here to this country looking for a dark, mysterious chocolate. I'll let you in on a secret. I haven't found it. I still haven't found it, y'all. I still haven't found it. So I'm gonna leave you with a chocolatier's five-step recipe 
into building your own confidence model. Step one, choose your ingredients. We humans, we tend to act like sheep, doing everything that our parents did, mentors did, our friends did. Yet instead of that, identify what are your unique strengths? Where would you best fit in this world? And if you don't know that, give yourself time to discover that for yourself. Step two, imagine your chocolate. Define what success means to you. Not to the world, not to the society, not to your dad. What it means to you. Try different things. Be okay with making mistakes. Mistakes will take you much farther than doing the same thing. Step three, be aware of what other people add onto your chocolate. So this is sort of a daily collection of time. So take inventory of all the forces acting on your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Look at the forces that are helping you grow and the ones that are no longer serving you. Nurture the ones that brighten your soul and neutralize the negative forces. To do that, expand your flavor palette. To neutralize the negative forces acting on your life, you need to build your internal force. Start believing in yourself. No questions asked, one day at a time. Work on shedding that negative self-belief, the lie, the fear, the shame, the guilt, the jealousy, and try new things like spending time with yourself, journaling, meditating, going to therapy. Because now, when you fail, when people give up on you, you're not gonna crumble. You're not gonna lose faith in yourself. And then, go eat that chocolate. Go get everything that you want in that world. Go get that dream job, that Nobel Prize, that fit body. Because confidence does not come from external achievement. It comes from internal acceptance. Once your inner confidence is solid, Success is not going to change you. Failure is not going to break you. So, do me a favor. Indulge in your little eight-year-old self. Take a bite into that chocolate and marvel in the wonder it beholds. Because you never know how little moments like these can change your life forever. Thank you.